I don't mean to scare you with this uh, folder I just brought up here. <laughs> and I hate speaking from a lectern and from a podium and so forth. So I'm just going to be up here for a few moments. I'm going to read something that I think is very, very important, very, very apt, very, very timely, even though it's over half a century old. This is a speech by a five-star general, arguably the most important general other than possibly his colleague, George Caput Marshall, in the United States in the 20th century. If it hadn't been for Dwight Eisenhower and George Marshall, we probably would be Spracken Sie Deutsch right now, or some other nasty outcome of what was probably the greatest conflagration the world has ever seen. We call it World War II. This is not his speech when he walked out of the White House in January 1961, which everyone ought to know, and many do. Very few people know this speech. This is a speech he gave in 1953, about this time of year, April the 16th, 1953, to the American Society of Newspaper Editors. At that time, a very powerful group of people. At that time, they were not owned by six wealthy oligarchs. At that time, they were independent. They had come out of World War II with such men as Hanson Baldwin and Drew Pearson and Walter Lippmann and Ernie Powell, though Ernie didn't make it out. They were people who cared about their responsibility to inform this democracy as to what was happening to it, particularly what was happening perpetrated by its leadership. This was the idea of the Founding Fathers. They didn't have the concept of the media that we have today, but they certainly had a concept of, as Jefferson said quite eloquently, facts battling themselves, literally fighting in the square, in the public square, and the truth coming out of that. This is 1953 Dwight Eisenhower in what was called by him the Chance for Peace speech. A very apt title for your group. This is one portion of it. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone, it is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the threatening cloud of war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. I want to modify that speech just a bit. I want to give it the way it should be given at this moment. You'll note some of the language stays the same, but some changes. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed, those who would challenge and defeat climate change and not just deny it while knowing the full ravages will come later after they're dead and those who would like to have a college education but who cannot afford the equivalent of a home mortgage on their back when they graduate. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of the laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of the children, perhaps even the existence of the human race given climate change 
in the ever-present existence and growing numbers of nuclear weapons. The cost of one F-35 lightning strike fighter is 340 modern homes in an average American city. And the cost of the entire F-35 program is seven and a half million college educations at the best public universities in America with no cost to the student. The cost of a single Ford class aircraft carrier is 100 modern hospitals in small towns across America. The cost of the U.S. Marine Corps Osprey program is enough solar paneling to provide electricity for New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles for half a century. And the cost of the U.S. Army's recruiting program, recruiting program, last year alone would buy 20 years supply of the most in-use medications for over 10,000 average elderly citizens. And let one repeat those final lines of Ike's and modify them only slightly. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of today's endless wars, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Five-star general. No man, no man in America knew the military knew the Defense Department like Dwight Eisenhower. To his granddaughter Susan, he said one day in the Oval Office, God help America if anybody ever sits here who doesn't un understand the military the way I do. He was absolutely correct. Today we have become what Eisenhower's worst nightmares predicted in his farewell address. We have become beholden to that complex that this year marked its greatest year in history. It sold more weapons than anybody else in the world at a greater total billion dollar figure than ever before. We are the merchants of death for seven billion people. Not for that alone, but certainly as a reason or a fallout from that, we now have, by polling data, three and a half billion people in the world who say that the number one threat to their and their children's future is the United States of America. Dick Cheney, you have succeeded. You always said you wanted to be feared, not loved or respected. Well, you succeeded. Half the world now hates our guts. People in Pakistan, you would think they would hate India, right? Number one enemy, number one threat to Pakistan is India. No, 88% think the United States is the number one threat to their future. Egypt, 80%. Korea, a signatory ally with the United States, 67% of the people think we're the number one threat to their future. This is an incredible situation we've created, but it is not just because of the warfare state. It has other complicating factors. One of the most profound of those factors is the fact that we now sit in a year and at the end of a decade or two that marks the greatest maldistribution of wealth in the history of this republic, worse than 1929. It's not the top 10%. Hell, some of you may be in the top 10%. It's the top 0.001%. 400 families in America have the gross domestic product of Brazil. 400 families. Think about that for a minute. And this is not income. This is wealth. The difference is stunning when you think about it. You probably, like me, work for income. You labor for income. That's what about 70% plus of this nation does. These people don't work for income. Their wealth creates more wealth and more wealth and more wealth. That's all it creates is wealth. That's called capital. 
that capital is now taxed at an overall less rate than your income that you make from your sweat and your hard work and your tears. All they do is invest that capital and make money. Same in France, same in Germany, same in England. It is the worst it has ever been since tax records have been kept. For us, that's about 1912. For Europe, it goes back to the French Revolution. It is terrible. A Chinese scholar once said, you can talk about anything in the world and usually have a decent conversation, maybe throw a few chairs, maybe a rock or two, but you can usually debate until until you talk about the distribution of wealth, and then you better get your gun. Remember what Dr. Martin Luther King began to talk about right before he was assassinated in Memphis? He began to talk about the Vietnam War and its stupidity and wealth and the distribution thereof. That's what Lu Hassan meant when he said, get your guns when you talk about the distribution of wealth. A senator said to me the other day, Larry, he dismissed everyone from his office except me and him. Even dismissed his own staff. Looked at his watch and he said, I've got to vote in a few minutes, but I want to ask you a question. The question is going to beg your military expertise. That's the reason I dismissed everyone else. Plus, I don't want anybody to know I'm asking this question, which is why I'm not telling you the senator's name. <laughs> He said, Larry, I'm gonna point you, I'm gonna paint you a scenario. Scenario is this. This was about the time that it looked as if the Republicans were gonna lose at least one of the houses. They subsequently did, of course. He said, let's just posit that we lose both houses of Congress or one house of Congress, and let's say that the articles of impeachment in the House, which are already there, grow in support, detail, and power. And let's just say for a moment that they get to the point where they attract the even members, this is a Republican, they attract the even members of our party. And let's just say that we get to the point we did with Richard Nixon. And we take the leadership of the Congress over to the White House, and we lay the articles of impeachment down and we say to the President of the United States, look, you've got two choices. You can walk out of here just as Richard Nixon did, resigning from the office, and we will leave you alone. You just go your merry way. We won't even turn you over to New York. <laughs> or you can find us and, and stay, and, and we will prosecute these articles of impeachment, and we will remove you from office, and, and, will prosecute you and your entire family to the full extent of the law. I'm listening to this, wrapped. <laughs> then he looks at me and he says, now here's my question. When Trump calls his legions to the streets with their guns, what will the US military do? I said, Senator, you put me in a real box. I could give you an academic answer and tell you that the enlisted ranks basically voted for Trump. The NCO ranks were split, and the officer ranks, eh, 20 to 60, 20 to 80, something like that. But I can tell you that I don't think the American military will shoot Americans. He said, well, that's comforting to an extent because basically the FBI tells me, and he's right on this, that Trump's base owns 90% of the guns in there, which the FBI will also tell you number around 350 million. I own 13 guns myself. <laughs> so that's not an exorbitant figure. It sort of reflects where we are today with all these school shootings and everything else. And I wonder every time I wake up and hear about a new one when we're going to do anything about that. But it, it, it got me to thinking. He had to leave. He had to get, we're walking down the corridor. He's going to vote. And I'm, I'm walking with him for a few minutes. And then he walks away. And I'm thinking, you know, this is a sitting senator feeling this way. Are we really at that point? Are we at the point where that sort of thing could happen? No, we aren't. That's the real issue, we aren't. 
for whatever reason we aren't, because you can't get America that riled up, nor could Trump. He could get some of the Charlottesville crowd out there, some of the Nazis, some of the David Dukes and so forth, and maybe they might do something, but the FBI would be enough to stop that if you could get the FBI. <laughs> so it's not a question, really, of that sort of a challenge, I don't think. The challenge is waking Americans up. We are losing our democracy, if we haven't already lost it, in terms of it being a democracy. We are sacrificing everything that that big conflict that I just quoted the iconic five-star general from gained for us. And if you go back to 1946 and 47, you see some very smart people sitting around a table, and then in other places, like the new Pentagon, like across the hill in the Congress, the Senate and the House. You see them in the White House. They're trying to grapple with this. If you go back and you read the archives, you understand that there were some people who understood what was coming and the challenge it was going to present. And they tried to put down in statute the 1947 National Security Act. They tried to put down in statute a mechanism, an institutional fabric, we call it the deep state today, that would both manage this new overwhelming power we had, which they knew outstripped Rome. Rome never even dreamt of the power that we had in 1945. We had 50% of the world's GDP. We made 55,000 airplanes in a single year. We can barely make 20 in a single year now. We had 7,000 ships in the Army. We had over 14,000 ships in the Navy. We have 270 today. We were the colossus of the world. Not only that, the rest of the world that counted was prostrate, France. Germany, England, Japan. We had firebombed Tokyo, burned it to a frazzle, and then just to add pain to misery, we dropped two atomic bombs on it. We were unprecedented in our power. So these people got together and they said, just as important as that day in Philadelphia, that month, that summer, where they crafted the Constitution, they sat down and they crafted this statutory framework very carefully in an attempt to maintain our democracy while at the same time protecting it from external threats. They made a huge mistake. And that mistake was leaving alive something we had never had in our history, colonial or national. An industrial complex aimed at war. Franklin Roosevelt created it and arguably had rationale for creating it. After all, we were going to fight arguably the most efficient, effective army the world had ever seen, the Vermont. <clears throat> but he should have disbanded after the war. We had never had a standing industrial base for war. Now it eats us alive. Not only does it produce F-35 strike fighters that cost $135 million a copy, a million dollars for the helmet the pilot wears, but they don't work. We actually have a defense base that charges us maximum money for crappy products. No one's more aware of that than the military, and they simply don't know what to do about it because the leadership of the military has no moral courage whatsoever. They just simply keep going along with it, and they keep saying, give me more money. I actually heard a chief of service the other day say something like this. This is almost a direct quote. Those damn taxpayers just have to pony up. Give them more money. Look at your army. Your army, 40% of it comes from seven states. You can name them. One of those places where a lot of them come from is the interior of Maine. I've had conversations with Susan Collins and Angus King about this. The interior of Oklahoma, West Virginia, the poorest states in the Union produce half or better of your land forces. They're bribed 
to come into the service. They are the third and fourth quintiles of America. You don't see Princeton graduates going into the military, Cornell graduates, Widmer Mary graduates, maybe a few from ROTC, but nothing else. They're not there. So what happens? America has no skin in the game. No skin in the game at all. I can go to Kansas and ask people if they can go to a map and find Afghanistan, and they'll look at me and say, what? What is Afghanistan? This is no joke, let alone say something like Djibouti. Where's Djibouti? Where's the Strait of Hormuz? Where's Aden? Where's this war you call Yemen? Greatest humanitarian disaster since World War II? Cholera outbreak unprecedented? Yemen? Where is that? These are actual responses across America. We don't know. Who's Mohammed bin Salman? The bloodthirstiest, greatest sponsor of terrorism on the face of the earth with whom you are allied. Prosecuting a war in Yemen that he's losing while at the same time destroying the security mechanism that we created in the Gulf called the Gulf Cooperation Council by going against his arch enemy in Qatar. <coughs> So we have everything we've ever worked for in the Middle East, and great treasure and blood, mind you, going to hell in a handbag. And we gave it the kick to do so with the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And as we make mistake after mistake after mistake, a guy in Moscow by the name of Vladimir Putin comes along behind us and picks up the pieces and capitalizes on them. So who's the victor? in Syria right now, Russia, Iran, and Bashar al-Assad. I say, fine, that's the only way you're gonna get stability back. So let's get out, let's leave and bring stability back. Let Bashar al-Assad bring stability back to Syria so his people can come home. No, we have mounted now another covert operation to try and thwart the political agreement that Iran, Turkey, Russia, and Damascus are working on. Just as we have mounted our third coup in Caracas, we tried to throw out Hugo Chavez in 2002. Don't refute me on that, I was there. And we failed. So we tried about a year ago to throw Nicolas Maduro out. He's a little more incompetent than Hugo Chavez, so that was gonna be easy. 48 hours ago, Gina Haspel, the director of the CIA, told the President of the United States it's over. Juan Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez will be in charge tomorrow morning. Don't worry, Mr. President, it's all over. The coup is gonna be successful. It wasn't. Now we have a potential for civil war in Venezuela. All because of the United States. Iran, what are we doing in Iran? We had a nuclear agreement. We, we had taken Iran from having 5,000 centrifuges to having almost none to having no processed material, to having an <clears throat> inspection regime that was so dominant, I would never have accepted it had I been a state power with any pride and dignity. We had their plutonium producing mechanisms going down the road, concrete filled and so forth. Now, Trump is even working on that by restricting the people in the world who were working on that. Why? Because he wants Iran to violate the nuclear agreement. Why? Because he wants to go to war with Iran. Maybe Trump doesn't, maybe John Bolton does. I don't know, we're gonna see this, this incredible fight probably between his national security advisor and himself. I think what Trump wants is a Kim Jong-un moment, moment. He wants to negotiate with President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif. He wants to be able to sit down in some foreign city, Geneva, and he wants to jump up from the table and say, see, I told you I could get a better deal than Obama. I've just gotten it. And it includes ballistic missiles and terrorism and all this other kind of stuff. I, I, can, I got a better deal. I've got a better deal. That's what he wants to do. But John Bolton wants to go to war. I know John Bolton. I sat in John Bolton's office with the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, East Asia and the Pacific. We were in there because the secretary had told us to go in there and tell John to shut up about North Korea. He was violating White House policy. We did not want a war with Korea. John wanted a war with Korea. When I finished telling John what a war with Korea would be like in the Seoul area with hundreds of thousands of Americans there, 
dead, wounded, soul of fire, Passchendaele, Ypres, Sudan type artillery around there. Yes, the South would win, we would win ultimately, but we'd take a lot of casualties and one of the most modern, forward looking cities in the world would be virtually destroyed. And John looked at me and Jim Kelly and he said, I don't do war, I do policy, you guys do war. We knew it was stupid to continue the conversation, but we, we did tell him to shut up. <laughs> did he shut up? No. He went out and said Cuba had biological four level facilities and biological warfare capability. He went out and said Bashar al-Assad had all these different things and a nuclear program. And he was lying about all of that because John doesn't care about the truth. All John cares about is getting what he wants, which is American sovereignty unthreatened by anyone on the face of the earth. That's why he doesn't like treaties. He doesn't like the United Nations. He doesn't like agreements. He just likes power. You have to meet someone like this to understand what I'm talking about. Someone like Richard Bruce Cheney. The one criticism I had of the movie Vice, I told the scriptwriter, the screenwriter, who was also the maker of the movie, I said, you know, I know why you did this for aesthetic balance. You dealt with Dick Cheney's family, his wife and his daughter, especially the lesbian daughter, to, to give the movie some balance. I criticized that. He said, why? I said, because he's an evil man. You didn't need that balance. He's a totally evil man. And he is. John Bolton, same kind of person. Remember Aaron Burr? Remember Benedict Arnold? At least they had excuses. John does not have an excuse. John is just what we say in the military, an asshole. <laughs> and he's national security advisor to a president who doesn't know his butt from a hole in the ground. So there's lots of room. You see what's happening with Cuba and with Venezuela? It's not Trump, it's Marco Rubio, who just salivates over the prospect of getting back to Cuba and reestablishing Batista's regime and getting his property back, and his family property back. And it's Rick Scott from Florida who salivates over 300,000 Venezuelans whom he thinks he's gonna to deliver to Trump so the 27 electoral votes from Florida will be his. Where have we been down this path before? You know who counted the hanging chads for George W. Bush in Florida in 2000? John Bolton. We've been down this road. We know these people. They're the same people, and yet, and yet, we do nothing. The country marches on to yet another war, another trillion dollar fiasco, another bloodbath for young men and women who are signed up because they were bribed to do so. And that's not to disparage them at all. They're patriots, they're doing their job the best they can. But we're destroying them. We're destroying their families. Divorce rate off the charts in the services now. Suicide rate off the charts in the services now. More post-traumatic stress than you'd ever imagine. Why would you not think a young lady or a young man who you gave $40,000 to sign a contract to from West Virginia, never seen that much money in their life nor expect it ever to, why would you think coming from a broken family un un undoubtedly would come home and be sane and sound after murdering people in Afghanistan or Iraq. Why is PTS off the charts? They shouldn't be in there in the first place. We have let this happen. All across <coughs> the country, we have let this happen. We have let this maldistribution of wealth happen. We have let people jerry-rig the states to where only Republicans can be elected. We have let people do things all across this country that destroy our <laughs> democracy. What did Tennessee just do? Tennessee just passed the most draconian law. No Supreme Court would ever support it, but this one will. Mark my words, this one will. That essentially says you can't vote if your skin's not lily white and you're not an Opus Dei Catholic or whatever. Look at that law, it's incredible. If you go out, if you go out and organize 100 Tennesseans to register them and vote them, and you make a single mistake, 
on any of those forms, you will go to jail. How many times have you ever put 100 forms together with social security numbers, addresses, telephone numbers, and you didn't make a mistake on one of the forms? That's what that law says. This is an effort by the Republicans in charge in Tennessee to disenfranchise every voter in Tennessee who won't vote for them. North Carolina, I just came from Asheville. I heard the st same story down there. They showed me some of their districts. The gerrymandering is so blatant that you'd think any judge anywhere would reverse that almost instantly. No. North Carolina is a perfect place to go to see the United States in microcosm. 50-50. 50-50. 50 percent thinks that Trump is great and 50 percent thinks he should be taken out and impeached immediately. It's an incredible experience to go there and go from one campus to another, one county from another, and see this. It's extraordinary. Not for nothing was North Carolina the place where the CIA flew its plane on the rendition, interrogation, and torture program. About 140 people were rendered out of a taxpayer-funded municipal airport in North Carolina. They participated in torture. They participated in war crimes. They perpetrated war crimes. And half of North Carolina hates that they did that, and the other half says, well, it was in the name of national security. <laughs> yeah, right. And guess who's sitting on the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence Chairmanship right now? Richard Burr from North Carolina. Guess who kept the 6,000-page report the Senate Select Committee did under Dianne Feinstein on torture? Out of the public domain, Richard Burr. Guess who's hiding all the people who tortured and committed war crimes? Richard Burr, North Carolina. I wouldn't have their problem for all the tea in China. I don't see how they deal with it politically, because it's 50-50. One minute they get a Democratic governor, the legislature, a Republican, just, you know, just mulls everything he does. Just, I'll pass a law. You, oh, pass a law. You do that, pass a law. Then they get a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature, same thing. Stasis, nothing happens. Meanwhile, the citizens of North Carolina are ill-served. But the 50% that loves the Trump-like effect loves that situation. They don't see beyond what's happening to them. Just like many of the people I encounter all across the country, from Ohio to Idaho, don't see what's happening to them and don't understand what's happening to them, partly because the media's failed partly because their governments have failed. I'm in Idaho, northern Idaho, Coeur d'Alene. Get a telephone call. I'm out there fly fishing. I don't want to talk politics. I get a telephone call. Born ID. He says, he's a Swedish American. He says, come over and see me. I know he's a really wealthy real estate developer in Coeur d'Alene, so I want to go see him. I go see him. He says, you're a Republican. I'm a Republican. We want to throw the bastards in Boise out. I said, why do you want to throw the Republicans in Boise out? He says, because they hate clean water. And we love clean water. And they hate public lands. And we love public lands. I said, I'm with you. Let's work. We'll throw them out. And we're working to throw them out. That's got to be done in every state. Every state has to take this kind of action. You have to wake up and say, I'm getting rid of these people. Susan Collins. Let me just tell you something about Susan Collins. I've been talking to Susan Collins about the greatest freaking humanitarian disaster on the face of the earth at the time, Yemen. And she says to me, it's a niche issue. And I go, Senator, you got to be kidding me. And she realized right away she made an impolitic remark. So, you know, her staff jumped in and she jumped in. And but that's, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. It's incredible. I went into another senator's office. This one, a Republican, and I started talking to him about him. And he said, oh, we, we have to have Saudi Arabia. We have to have Saudi Arabia. They buy our treasury bonds. They buy our debt. We have to have Saudi Arabia. Why, Senator? Why would you want to ally yourself with the greatest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, with the real problem in the Middle East, with all the poisonous future that that represents? Why? It's just basic. They're, in, they're the enemy of Iran. Well, why would you think Saudi Arabia would be an enemy of Iran? This is a very interesting conversation. Do you know why I said so? Because Iran has a modicum of democracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have elections. 
They may pick people to run, but they still have a modicum of democracy. Democracy in any fashion, shape, or form is anathema to Riyadh. Those tyrants cut people's heads off with axes who believe in things like voting. Mm -hmm. They are our allies. One of the reasons they're our allies is the most difficult, intractable problem in that region. It's called Israel. And it's called Israel particularly under Bibi Netanyahu and the ultra-right-wing government he runs, which is in essence a Zionist government for the future of Israel expanding until it can expand no more. We're alive to that. Go back and read the report the Joint Chiefs of Staff prepared for Harry Truman before he recognized Israel in 1948. I read it to my students sometimes so they can see that at times we're pretty smart. Because what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Joint Chiefs and George Marshall predicted was exactly what has happened. That we would become so enamored of, so attached to, so buddy-buddy with this little government in the Eastern Mediterranean that they would begin to determine our fate. And that's what they're doing. Gideon Levy of Haaretz said recently that U.S. and Middle East policy is not made in Washington, it's made in Tel Aviv. And he would have said Jerusalem if he'd said it today. It's incredible what we allow that little state to do to our foreign and security policy and to our budget. Mm -hmm. We used to go to the budget drill at the State Department. Six billion was about all we got at that time for foreign policy. By the time we took the three billion we gave to Israel, no questions asked. And the three billion we gave to Egypt, no questions asked, to keep the peace treaty with Israel. We had about 400 million yet left for U.S. foreign policy. The Defense Department was at that time getting about 300 billion. Whoa. When you have a cash balance like that differential, you're going to favor the gun over the diplomacy every single time. Jim Mattis said one of the smartest things he ever said was, if you're not going to give the State Department more dollars, buy me more bullets. Why have we allowed this country that our founding fathers thought was an empire of liberty, an empire of freedom, whose greatest and most powerful weapon in the world would be our example to turn into what it is when Simone Bolivar, back up a little bit, Friday last, I was in Washington. I got a telephone call from a former CIA officer for Latin America. He said, Larry, will you go to New York with me? I said, what are we going to New York for, Putin? Putin. He said, we're going to New York to meet with the Venezuelan foreign minister and the Venezuelan ambassador to the United Nations. What's our purpose? We're going to try to give them some way out. We went and we met. Young foreign minister, really probably no more than 35, 40 years old. Very articulate, very Venezuelan, very much convinced that he was on the right side. Not so much because of Nicolas Maduro, but because Nicolas Maduro was the elected president of Venezuela through a constitutional process. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know much about Venezuela's history, it is not Colombians, it is not Brazilians, it is not Argentinians, and it's certainly not Panamas or Nicaraguas or Honduras. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is the bastion of long lived democracy in South America, however imperfect. And we're anybody to be telling somebody that democracy is imperfect. <laughs> So his pride was palpable. And he looked at me and he said, we are not Panama. You cannot drop the 82nd Airborne down on us, kill 3,000 of our citizens, take our president to Miami. You cannot do that. We will fight you tooth and nail. We will go to the mountains. We will go to the hills. We will fight you forever. And he leaned back in his chair and I said, 
Mr. Minister, I know you're telling the truth. I've trained some of your troops. I know they're good troops. I know the reason there's no civil war in Venezuela right now is because they adhere, however imperfectly, to their constitutional responsibility. So how can we keep this from happening? How can we, at the very moment we uttered our final words before he had to go, the United States announced that it had declared them persona non grata and in a very diplomatic terminology that, that really reeks with arrogance, persons not to be in New York City. That's what it really amounts to. So they had to leave. They had to get up and leave right there on the spot. They had to pack their goods. All their staff had to pack their goods. They had to leave New York upon being arrested if they didn't. What arrogance, what hubris, what stupidity. And guess what happened yesterday if you didn't follow it? Apparently, the president talked to Vladimir Putin and Putin talked him out of a military operation in Venezuela. I wanted to stand up on the back of my chair on the airplane and applaud. Yeah. So what if he's complicit with Putin? This is a smart move. Let the Venezuelans decide their own fate and keep El Poroso del Norte out. But this is a, this is a, a very short live victory probably. One doesn't know, as my students will tell you, after doing case study after case study for 13 weeks, three hour seminar each week on this administration. Very mercurial, very narcissistic, very incredibly wrapped up in domestic politics more than anything else. The German foreign minister was right when he said President Trump didn't leave the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran because of security reasons, he left it for his base. That's what the German foreign minister said, and he was right. He made a promise to the base, he fulfilled his promise, on to the next promise. That's what we have in Washington now. None of this is going to change until you get people like you multiplied 100,000 times over, and you start taking every form of action that you possibly can. I, I looked over at the Venezuelan embassy and I saw that Ms. Benjamin was occupying the embassy. I called her on the phone and I said, what do you need? You need somebody else to come over there? She said, oh, I got lots of volunteers. We're prepared to stay here forever. There's courage. There's moral and physical courage. I know it's hard. We've got jobs, we've all got things to do. We've got families, we've got grandchildren and children and so forth. But if we don't take action across this country. We are going to be in such deep trouble in a very short time that we might not be able to get ourselves out of it without a cataclysm. Either an internal domestic cataclysm or an external one, or both. They tend to sort of, historically speaking, accompany one another. We are talking about a really bad future if we don't shift a few degrees at least, and I would like to see it shift markedly, the course of this ship of state, we are going to have real serious, serious problems. Thank you. Because we need two parties, and because there are four of us left. <laughs> you can probably name them as best as you and, and we want to retake our party. Um, out in the hustings, as I talked to you about in Coeur d'Alene, in other places like Houston, I encountered this too. There are people 35 to 50 who are of the same mind as I am, and it's a long-term haul. It's not a quick solution, but we want to change the Republican Party. And let me just hasten to add, the man who stood in our way on getting the United States out of the war in Yemen most powerfully was Steny Hoyer, a Democrat. So both of them take money from the complex, both of them. The best thing we could do for the national security of the United States of America is to shut down about three quarters of the 800 bases we have in the world.
Actually, you know who the last person was who took action against that? Called them all back. Secretary Rumsfeld. Secretary Rumsfeld in 2000 and 2001 called every military officer working externally to the Pentagon back to the Pentagon or to their duty otherwise. From the Congress, from the State Department, from everywhere, he pulled them all back. And then he said, I'm gonna study whether I should send them back or not. Pretty astute move, really, if you think about a civilian secretary trying to establish his rule over a body that had become almost totally uniform. Six months later, he had sent them back because everybody who had them found them to be efficient, effective, and almost priceless. So the Congress got them back, the State Department got them back, everybody in the bureaucracy got their military officers back. Here's a part of the problem. The military gets the job done. The military is mission oriented. If you tell the military to go do something, they will generally go do it. If your civilian bureaucracy is falling apart, if you can't attract good people into your civilian bureaucracy, if you're de-emphasizing that civilian bureaucracy by cutting its funding and so forth, as is the case across the cabinet, the military becomes the weapon of choice. This is part of the problem in Washington. This is part of the problem why Young people, for example, from my seminars, I have to talk hard into going into public service. Not the Peace Corps. William & Mary leads the country for universities of its size, size putting people in the Peace Corps. When I, when I get somebody into the NSA or the CIA, or as recently happened, into the Geospatial Agency or something like that, I feel like I've gotten a small triumph because I know these kids' character, I know their families, I know how talented they are, I know how smart they are. But I also know that I'm competing with Deloitte Touche, Goldman Sachs, and all the other people who want them to come to Wall Street and make a million dollars in their first 10 years, or more. I have a young student right now, a ski on, a, a family of extraordinary, extraordinary public service in Virginia, mayors, governors in his lineage. And Harrison came in to see me right before graduation. He said, I'm going to work for Goldman Sachs. And I said, Harrison, you're one of the brightest kids I've ever had in my seminar. You need to do public service. Let's talk about this. No, no, I'm going to work for Goldman Sachs. Two million dollars in his first three years. Talked to him the other day. I said, Harrison, you're going to come back and do some public service? He said, Yeah, I'll come back and be a cabinet officer or something like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he's got his sights set real high, and he may indeed do that, and he may make a great Secretary of Defense or State or Assistant Secretary or under or whatever. But that's a real challenge. These young people, they go to Wall Street, they go where they can make tons of money. They don't go to the government, state, local, or federal. They go to Wall Street. Can you blame them? with Wall Street at offering what it offers. And we sit back, like in 2007 and 8, and we say, I wonder why the SEC got so beaten so badly by Wall Street. Or why any government agency got beaten so badly by Wall Street. Well, you sent Princeton, Harvard, Cornell, Columbia to Wall Street. What do you expect? You damn sure didn't send them into the armed forces. They wouldn't go there. Bolton is another man all the other. And Trump is another man all the other. I, I, I continue to think, first of all, HR made Trump really angry. HR McMaster. HR McMaster, who was the national security advisor before Bolton. Okay. HR was a bright guy. And he tended to argue with Trump. And he tended to point out the bad aspects of Trump's decision making, including his damn tweeting. HR hated this tweet. So Trump finally gets rid of him and brings in someone who will kiss his ass. And that's what Bolton has done. Bolton is smart enough to realize that Trump's inattention gives him a lot of room for maneuver. And so he kisses up. But at the time Trump leaves after getting his kiss, <laughs> Bolton is maneuvered. And he's maneuvered with people like Marco Rubio and Rick Scott 
Elliot Abrams and a host of others. That's not that hard to do in Washington. You don't think watch Trump's in charge of that whole process? Yeah, I watched better presidents than Trump allow this to Trump just set Bolton off to be kind of a, a fool, a jester? Not really. You think? Not really. It's another way around. Bolton looks at him as the jester. <laughs> You may have read in Dexter Filkin's article that supposedly Bolton said Trump was a moron. That's the beginning of John's departure from the White House. As soon as Trump is, that has that call to his attention, or reads it himself, which, which would be rare, that's the beginning of John's departure from the White House. You don't call President Trump a moron. So watch that closely. <laughs> it can't happen fast enough as far as I'm concerned. But then who's going to... Who's going to replace him? Question. <laughs> if, you've, if you haven't ever listened to the Nixon tapes, I don't mean just David Frost's version. I mean the tapes. You need to. This is one of the most venal, poisonous, evil-tongued individual you'd ever want to hear in your life. Now, was he a bad president? Uh, we can debate that. But on those tapes, you get Richard Nixon in his most vilest form. And when he says things like those kikes, those Jews over there at Pocky Bottom, and he looks at Henry Kissinger, he says, oh, I'm not talking about you, Henry. You know, Henry was Jewish, too. And when he talks about those commie, pinko, fago Jew kikes at the State Department, that's Nixon's view of the State Department. He didn't go to China to meet with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai with his Secretary of State as his principal partner. He took Rogers with him, put him in a Dow tie cottage at the end of the road, and he and Henry met with Joe and Mel. Secretary of State never set foot in the room. Nixon hated the State Department. Republicans do not like diplomacy. They do not like the State Department. They do away with it tomorrow if they could and save money, just as they do away with Medicare, do away with Medicaid, privatize Social Security, and so forth. This is the real danger in the Republican. And they are working hard to get all three branches of government in that baby. Watch what they do with Roe v. Wade. Don't believe them for a minute. They pack the court to get rid of Roe v. Wade. Don't believe them for a second that the Supreme Court and the justice in charge of it will suddenly wake up to democracy and constitutionalism and say, oh, no, eh, I vote with this group. I vote with this group. No, no, no. This is preacher packing the Supreme Court for the purpose of the Republican Party. And one of those purposes is to destroy diplomacy as an instrument of national power. They think it's a waste of time. One of the reasons they do is because they're so inept at it. They're utterly inept at it. You go back and look at people like John Quincy Adams, who was probably the best diplomat America ever had. And you see what diplomacy is really all about. It was often rumored in the White House, truthfully, I think, that the President of the United States, when John Quincy Adams was at the court of Catherine, knew more about Napoleon's movements in Europe than Napoleon did. That's because he was a diplomat. He knew the power of diplomacy in both intelligence gathering and in effecting agreements and cordiality between states and among states. We don't know that anymore. What we do in Washington now is follow our rule or we'll bash you. That's the mantra in Washington. If you don't do what we tell you to do, we'll bash you. Either through economic sanctions, which we are using to the extent that the rest of the world is going to abandon the dollar within the next 10, 10 to 20 years, if not quicker, and we're going to suffer big time when they do that. Because you know how we're keeping our debt manageable in one sense is because we can deflate it all the time by deflating our own currency, which is the world's reserve currency. We can reduce our debt, boom, gee, just push the dollar down. Charles de Gaulle said it was the most vicious weapon we had. He's right. The rest of the world has figured it out. And the rest of the world, including Russia and China and the lead, are going to figure out a way around our financial network and around our system. And when we're left out in the cold, we're going to be sitting there holding our fingers trying to figure out what happened.